Uh, hello, so my name is Mike Ausendorf. Um, I'm uh, since a year now member of the German Parliament, uh, the, the Deutsche Bundestag, and speaker of the Green Groups for Digitization Politics. So I'm member of the Committee for Digitization and for Economy also. Um, before that, I was working more than 20 years in the IT industry um, in the open source area. So around New Year's Eve, I've uh, worked uh, at SUSE Linux uh, as a consultant. At that time, we did a lot of pioneer style projects uh, with companies and organizations of all sizes, nationally and internationally. Um, at that time, many of those uh, started first steps with Linux and open source technologies. Um, and uh, in 2004, I founded my own company together with some colleagues of the old SUSE team. And the, the whole time we did consultancy projects around uh, Linux, open source system management. So I'm very used to talk on conferences like these, but usually about topics like system management monitoring, uh, open source backups, and so on. So now this is the first time um, I'm coming back to this ecosystem and talking about politics. So this is the headline of the uh, German government's coalition treaty, Mehr Fortschritt Wagen, something like uh, Der the Progress, and the subtitle Alliance for Freedom, Justice, and Sustainability. And um, that's one of the points that we really are strange that is um, advancing digitization while shaping it sustainably. So that's one of the themes we uh, would like to stress overall. So um, I have four big outlines. So first, I want to talk about a little bit about digital infrastructure, then uh, sustainable digitization, digital sovereignty, and uh, circular economy. This is a little bit beyond digitization only, uh, but it's strongly connected. So I think this is an interesting point to talk about. So um, I do the presentation and afterwards we have uh, time for a uh, question and answer uh, round and uh, hopefully get into a, a discussion. Okay, so digital infrastructure, uh, latestly when it came to the pandemic situation, we have all learned that uh, good and broad digital infrastructure is essential for the uh, society to work. We've uh, seen that a lot of people uh, worked from, the, from home offices. We've also seen, especially in Germany, that most of the schools uh, have, still have very poor internet connections, um, didn't work very well. Um, so that was one reason to set up a new gigabit strategy, which was, which was published uh, before the summer break. And uh, this basically covers some points like um, getting up to new techniques when getting cables into the ground. So the, the conventional uh, type of getting fiber cables into the ground is very complicated, very deep, and there are more uh, modern techniques which are much faster and easier to, uh, to do, but we realize that a lot of um, regional and local authorities are very conservative and don't like these new techniques, which makes it difficult to get more power and more um, speed into it. And then one, one really big point is open access. So that means that uh, cable providers um, have to open their infrastructure to other uh, pro service providers so that they easily can offer services and um, make it easier for more companies to use the same network instead of putting two or three fiber cables into the same road. So that is one um, important point we, um, that we stress. Um, so, and then another point is that we see we have uh, large market players that dominate the market, the market, and especially for for the Green Party, it was uh, important to change the rules a little bit so that smaller companies, small, medium business sized companies, uh, have better chances to get into the business. So, this is. Um, about the, the real points that we put a focus on. And then, of course, we have a priority for uh, self-supported expansion rather than uh, publicly, publicly funded uh, expansion. And this seems to work quite well in Germany. So the, the companies uh, have announced that they want to invest around uh, 50 billion euros over the next years into the infrastructure. So that is a very good sign. And um, well, one word, one word about um, mobile. Um, 
communications. If you travel by train in Germany or come to more rural areas, you um, often realize um, that you have, um, so we call it white spots, where you don't have any connection anymore. And of course, we address this. So the goal is to have 100% uh, coverage with fast broadband mobile internet uh, in the whole country. So there's a proverb to say, we want to have internet at every milk can, so that you can use services like um, public transport on demand, um, self-driving cars, and things like uh, automatic automating um, uh, farmers that can use AI techniques for automated irrigation, for example. So we, we really need fast internet everywhere in the country, and so that is a common goal of the um, German government. So. Well, why talk about sustainable digitization? So it's commonly said that digitization is as, well, not as much as possible as um, important, but next to important to, uh, to climate protection because it's two sides of the, of the medal. So first thing is um, that digitization is kind of a problem when we look at the energy consumption. So we have two to four percent of the global CO2 emissions coming from the IT um, industry. So, so of course we have to work on that. We have to reduce the impact um, caused by the IT industry. And um, of the other hand, on the other hand, we need to um, make use of digital innovations to get new models, new business models, new ideas to um, reduce CO2 emissions overall, or in other words, to come to a more sustainable and climate neutral society and economy. So we have on the one side a problem and on the, one, on the other side a big chance, and we have to think both sides together to advance um, our society into a neutral uh, CO2 neutral society. So, and there are certain things we've um, put in, into the um, coalition treaty. One thing is about the uh, data centers that the government runs by itself. So they have to implement um, an environment management system until 2025. And the second thing is that we require new data centers to be cl climate neutral from uh, 27 onwards. So um, that are some basic things. Why have I put open source software here? Because uh, open source software is um, efficient by means of resources needed and uh, of course very sustainable because it can be reused by uh, yeah, everybody uh, who has access to it and usually so you, you publish open source and everybody can use it. So, and that, that's much more efficient than proprietary software because that leads to parallel um, developments, um, everybody puts, uh, every, every propriety software producer puts uh, the code into the, yeah, it's not open, and then we have parallel things that gets developed at the same time, and you don't get this with open source software. So green coding is one thing that you, when you start up coding uh, from, from the beginning, think about uh, energy consumption, efficiency, uh, one really important thing. And then we have um, the, the fifth point here, a sustainable circular economy. Um, I have another slide on that, but uh, especially when, when we think about um, digital products and uh, products um, that you use to access internet like phones, tablets, computers, um, most of us have realized that after a certain point they get broken. So it looks like that by design there's some, some deadline implemented in these devices and there's a new um, regulation from the um, EU com Commission um, that requires uh, things to be repairable for a longer time. So um, we address this on, as well as uh, on, the, on the nation level and as well on the, on the European level. Um, and then the, the last thing here is promotion of digital twins. Um, that is a, a really interesting point. Um, our, um, the thing we want to have is that of every analog product, you get a kind of digital pass, which includes all information uh, of materials used, information on how to repair a thing, 
um, so that will people enable to get their stuff repaired and um, so that you don't have to throw it away when it's broken. And the other thing is that these uh, digital twins means you have um, a digital model uh, of your analog product so that you can better uh, develop enhancements and um, keep all the information needed um, to, to repair uh, a product. So this is an overview of this topic. Then we have uh, the big point, uh, digital sovereignty. Um, this has come to focus uh, more and more after the, the war in the Ukraine has started. Um, even before polit politicians who were active in the field of digitization um, were aware that um, that's a big problem to, or a big issue that we have to care about sovereignty and be able to run, at least on a European level, our own infrastructure. Um, but since uh, we got the energy supply cut from the east, the, the argument um, to look about our data connections to the west, uh, which are at least as vulnerable as uh, gas pipelines, um, makes it more aware to a broader set of people. So um, over the last years, when I, when I still was uh, working in the IT industry, I realized that a lot of companies and even public organizations started to move part of their software installations uh, to data centers in the United States. So which, of course, is problematic for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, there's uh, the data protection. You don't know what they are doing with your data. I think most of you are aware of this because you're, you're coming from the uh, open source ecosystem. Um, but if you then imagine that after the East has cut energy supply from, from the East side, and we imagine, well, I don't hope it will um, become real, uh, but a Trump, Trump administration again after the next um, elections in the US could lead to, to another politics there. And then if you imagine, uh, a president that will, for whatever reason ever, cut data supply, or if you have some um, enemy state that does this using submarines or whatever. So if you really imagine the scenario that the complete data supply to the West is cut, then it comes very clear that we need a European answer for that, and that means we need European open source based infrastructure that can be used here and that which will make us completely independent from um, yeah from from the western countries or even from uh, from china so that 's really um, a key issue okay so then what what we are doing um, we have some open source specific projects so the so sovereign tech fund. Um, was introduced uh, last year, the first time we got a budget for this um, and then the federal budget and the Sovereign Tech Fund is meant to support um, open source projects, uh, libraries that are commonly used but where um, usually no companies are behind it. So to, to make sure that these essential projects get funded. So that's the intention of the Sovereign Tech Fund. Then another thing we have is uh, a Centris, um, a Centrum for a Centrum for Digitale Souveränität, so Center for Digital Sovereignty, that is uh, has a special purpose for the German government, um, ministries, and uh, authorities uh, who are using open source programs, projects, and want to get sure that they get support for the stuff they are using. So this is a kind of yeah, service center for the administration itself, uh, but of course has a big impact on the open source economy um, because it will uh, make sure that there is support for all the solutions being used in the pub public uh, administration. And that means um, that there will be um, like support or maintenance contracts with companies that provide services for specific open source software. So. And then next point, of course, Gaia-X, um, coming back to what I said at the beginning, um, this is a program to build a competitive open source based cloud infrastructure framework uh, as a basic layer so that um, service providers in Europe can set up um, an infrastructure for not only government but, only, uh, but also public users, companies to um, 
get services which are now provided only by the large hyperscalers in the US. So the intention is to have something competitive here in, in Europe, and that is uh, the Gaia X program, which is funded with quite some money from from German from the German government, but also from the French government. And um, I hope that we see more progress uh, with these projects in the near future. So then I've put the point cybersecurity here. Um, this is a large topic. I have a presentation for about this, uh, which is alone about 30 minutes, so I don't want to stress it here too much because then it will take another hour to talk about it, but just some words about it. Um, we have a cybersecurity agenda set up from the Ministry of Internal Affairs, which addresses already many of the important things, but I think it's not enough for now. We, we need uh, to intensify um, what we do here in this sector um, and especially in the uh, economy. So the government infrastructure, I think it is on a good way, but um, if you have a closer look at the German economy, so most of the companies in Germany are SMB, small and medium businesses, and they usually don't have uh, the IT staff to really care about the network they, they run. Um, as it would be necessary. Um, there's, um, there's a study of Bitcom, one of the largest German um, association of uh, internet companies or IT companies, and they have a study that says that more than 80% of German companies already uh, suffered from threats like ransomware, other kind of attacks, um, with an estimated damage of more than uh, 60 billion dollars, uh, euros, sorry. Um, basically caused by, by ransomware. And um, if you imagine that the, the ransomware software or similar software is not used only to uh, get money out of the, the companies, but if it was turned into um, intentionally get down the infrastructure of broad parts of the uh, German SMB um, company, so that would have and big, big impact of, uh, of the reliability of, of the economy. And uh, I think it's at least as important as um, military defense. And uh, I really know we have to do more here. We have already some programs um, in the Ministry of Economy, um, but we have to put more um, effort in this field, definitely. So, but I want to mention it here, but not to go any, any deeper because it will take another half an hour. So circular economy, um, this is really um, a key for, for our economy um, because we now see that we have uh, big problems with supply chain um, and of course raw materials are very rare, at least some of them, and it's clear at a certain point uh, there will be no more. So it's just a question of time. For, for humanity um, to enter into a circular economy, and the, the earlier we can do it, the better. So, and this means we have um, set up a national um, circular economy strategy, which, which starts with points like the right of repair, um, and of course the, the idea is to repair, reuse, reduce, and recycle at the end. And um, circular economy means not only to do uh, recycle stuff when, when a an, uh, an device is broken, but this means to start the progress when a device is designed. So um, the idea of cradle to cradle needs to be implemented right from the beginning. So when you start to develop a new product, you should think about what does happen with this device after its life cycle has ended. So to get um, most of it, again, when, when, when the product um, is broken at the end. So um, the good thing is that the uh, European Union um, has similar idea, ideas. So it's in the new uh, directive about product liability. And there is a program about circular economy action. So this goes all together. And um, we are looking forward to get steps into this direction. Of course, we know this will take, well, maybe decades until we get to a point where we can say, no, this is a circular economy, but uh, every step into that direction is really important. So let me conclude. So um, 
public policy can provide a framework, but at the end, uh, the society and especially the, uh, the economy um, has to act and uh, get us um, into uh, uh, a circular economy, into a climate neutral economy, and, uh, and we can set the framework, and that is what we are working on. Um, open source can make um, a big contribution if we think about uh, digital sovereignty and if we think about circular economy and um, efficient working altogether. So, and uh, as we've seen, uh, digitization requires a whole government approach. It is not just a single field. So, digitization politics is about everything. So, this is what I see in, in our everyday life at the parliament that we have uh, digital discussions in, in every field. And um, there are not a lot of people in the parliament with an IT background, but there are some, and that is, that is good, and, uh, and we see that it's good that we are in, in a steady dialogue with our colleagues in the other political fields. Um, um, but uh, I think we, we have to strange this and get, get more dialogues with, uh, with, the all, with all parts of the uh, government and all parts of the administration. So now it's uh, up to us to put the focus on the, the implementation. Uh, it's almost clear what we have to do, um, but uh, what I've realized over the last year is that uh, administrations really are kind of slow and it's, uh, it takes a lot of energy to, to move the course. So it takes some time and we have to do with every day, every day new, um, new dialogues, new discussions about the right way. Um, but that's, that's the way how politics work and so we are working to put the large ship into a new direction slowly um, and work on that all day. Thanks. All right. Mike, thank you so much. Let's move to the questions over. Mike, I think I fell a bit short in your introduction. So first of all, you are a member of the Bundestag, right? Yeah. Uh, you're a spokesperson for the digital policy and you act as a member of the Committee on Digital Affairs and the Committee on, no, the Committee of Digital Affairs and the Committee on Economic Affairs. Right. So with that, we have the opportunity to ask you quite some questions on this topic. So I invite everyone if they have questions, yeah. to put them forward and I give you the mic. Um, I'm going to say mic to you because we know each other when you, yeah, well, sure, yes. we were still hanging at uh, tech conferences. Uh, I think it's really good to have you here to bring a perspective, I think, on the political side of things. That's, of course, why we wanted, yeah, invited you. Uh, a lot of us here are working on technology um, and, and open source and digital sovereignty and it's really well, that's become even more important, as you pointed out, with the war. So my question kind of is, like, it's good to see the government is caring more about digital sovereignty. And I appreciate that people like you move from tech to, to well, politics to help, you know, guide the ship in the right direction. But my question is, what can we do as, as tech community here to help you, well, kind of help us or help us all, basically, to move things in the right direction? Ah, okay. Uh, thanks, Jos. Um, well, I think there's a lot of lot you can do. So one thing is have uh, conferences like this and uh, also engage yourself in other conferences. So there's, for example, the Bits and Bäume today, where, where Frank is. Uh, that is a conference on digitization and sustainability organized by uh, like um, non-governmental organizations, environmental organizations, social uh, organizations. Um, so, and... Uh, Raise your voice. So when, whenever it comes to, to discussions, uh, whether it's, it is with your friends or in a more public way, if, if in your community where you live, uh, um, conventions or whatever, raise your voice and, and point people to the, to the things that, that you find important. Yep. Allow me to also uh, ask you a question while I move this way. So. Uh, a bit of news here about, of course, the, um, the Nord Stream pipeline. So with the sabotage of that Nord Stream pipeline, we see how vulnerable critical infrastructure yeah. is, right? So, but how do we prepare for the scenario that transcontinental internet cables might be sabotaged? Yes, I've, I've mentioned that point in, in my talk. So that is really a threat. And um, 
the first thing is I, I think we can't really protect the lines by military measures. It's just too too long. So um, so the the conclusion is we have to think about what do we do if those lines get cut. Um, and it's not only the lines. Uh, Russia has has proved that they are able to shoot down satellites as well. So that's not the alternative. And uh, I heard some colleagues say, "Well, uh, we just have to lay more lines and we have to send up more satellites." I think that is not the solution. Um, that that's a horse race we can't win. So we have to prepare in a way that we get regionally independent. So, and by regional, I mean European, because I think on a nation level, that's not not suitable and 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 i'm and i think we have to leverage the um synergies we can do with our european partners um so gaia x and other projects are the way so we have to set up our own infrastructure and to be able to run everything here uh with with uh, our uh, resources in europe all right thank you Thank you for your talk and uh, your good overview of uh, different topics. And yeah, I got a couple of, of, of questions. Um, let me start with also the um, uh, cyber security things. Um, one of um, the yeah, things happening were that the German intelligence services were also hoarding this uh, zero day exploits for their own I mean, software or weapons or something. And this, of course, is contrary to digital sovereignty and also especially to protect people and uh, companies. Did something happen in this regard? Um, we have addressed this in, in the coalition treaty, so that, that were some uh, interesting nego negotiations. Um, um, to be more general, um, if, if you look what, what the press says, usually um, the, the press says that Greens and Liberals are kind of counterparts, but uh, if you come to the field of digital rights, um, we, have, uh, we fight together, so we have uh, uh, very same ideas. And, and one thing is that uh, we have... Um, uh, put into the coalition treaty that um, uh, public um, authorities have to um, work together with uh, software producers if they find um, a vulnerability in, in, a, in a software, so they have to report it. And um, we have uh, set um, the, the right of uh, secure communications in the coalition treaty. So that means things like uh, chat control, uh, is not part of the of the treaty, uh, and we will do everything to protect secure and uh, private communications. <laughs> uh, thank you. Is this an also the policy on the EU level? <laughs> no, it's not. As you probably know, that uh, there's a discussion on the EU level to. Uh, to allow yeah, what they call chat control. Um, and um, the difficult thing is that they argue uh, it's to protect children against um, po pornography and, and uh, violence. And, and of course, that's a strong argument. Um, um, and the, the bad thing is that uh, even people here in the German parliament who, are, who want to have more surveillance, uh, they argue the same way. And they put it, they frame it in a way that they say, if you are not if you're not um, in favor of more control, of chat control, uh, th then you work together with those criminals doing uh, child pornography. That's a very bad argument. Um, um, but we stand together and say there are better ways to defend uh, especially children um, and other vulnerable groups against criminality, uh, abuse, and stuff like that. Um, so, but this is a discussion that takes place. So the EU wants to have more control and the Ministry of Internal Affairs also says some things here in Germany, but um, uh, we, the Greens and the Liberals, stand against this and we have uh, put the thing in the coalition treaty. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the line of the discussion. Yeah. Uh, Bill, Bill Gates said that <clears throat> complexity is the enemy, right? Because it's just, and, and uh, what you've laid out mm. is multiple dimensions that have all got enormous complexity. Yeah. And so you look at it, go, I don't know what to make of that. And so, you know, if you look at the, like the um, data centers that need to be 
uh, neutral, you know, environment neutral. Well, they're dependent upon suppliers of energy yes. that is not in their control. And so the question I've got is, do you have something that says, say, take cyber security. You say, that is a real and present danger that mm -hmm. could have this amount of damage in this amount of time, and therefore its number is a seven. Whereas you said the circular economy is something that would have this amount over 30 years, therefore its number is a three. So you can come up with some sort of prioritized list to say, if you could do one and only one, <laughs> what do you do? Because otherwise you make tiny progress on lots of fronts and you don't meet the timeline. And is, is it better? For example, if you could solve the cyber security issue, you know, if you had a magic wand, what would you give up for that? And is there any sense of priority? Because listening to it, I go, so what's your priority? And if you go, we want to do all of them, I go, oh, okay, I don't know what, I, I don't know if there is any priority. And that's the question is, in your own mind, in the policy, is there a priority? Or are you just trying to plug all the holes you can see? Mm, well, that's an interesting question um, because politics, if you have a look at the government as a whole, doesn't work like this. So you have all the different resources and everybody does his work and every resort, every minister thinks his things or her things are the most important ones. So, And I think you, you said multidimensional is the right way. So we just can't get forward on one track and say, okay, we do the other ones afterwards because it's always an ongoing process. So um, I wouldn't say that one thing is much more important than the other thing. They are all important and um, I think we don't have the chance to uh, put it in a line and say, well, we put now 100% in cyber security and the next on, on circular economy. Uh, it doesn't work like this. So we always have to do things in parallel. So this is the last question. Thank you. Um, so in the past, we have uh, frequently seen um, uh, public IT projects fail due to design decisions, for example, uh, the email, um, mm -hmm. ID wallet, and so on. Uh, have you ever considered to make these um, public IT projects more transparent in the conceptual phase so more people can uh, have a say in it and the public could partake in the discussion, like for example with the um, uh, CV, yeah, yeah. Corona One app? Yes, uh, the Corona One app is from my perspective kind of blueprint for successful projects. And one thing we've also put into the coalition treaty is that we want to include uh, NGOs and the civil society um, more into politic decision ways. And um, that is something we uh, actually strange. We, we are in good contact with like organizations like the Cars Computer Club or Stiftung Neue Verantwortung and we try to involve them also in IT projects. It's not always uh, easy to um, implement this together with the, uh, with the ministries because they are kind of reluctant when uh, getting NGOs into decision processes, but it's my approach. Um, and, and I think it's also necessary if, if you talk about projects like Data Institute to, to share data, to have concepts, um, to uh, anonymize data, to make them usable for um, research, innovations, and companies. So, and there we really try to um, get them into the process as early as possible because I think it's it's mandatory if we want to have a transparent process and in the end convince people that this is the right way. Um, uh, we we have to work together with civil society. Uh, but to be honest, in, in every day's um, uh, progress, we see it's it's always a fight with the with the ministries to get them really in. But it's a good, good, good point, thanks. <laughs> All right. Mike, thank you so much for talking about this with us and also answering our questions. Um, I think it's very, it's, an, it's interesting times these days, so let's see where it brings us and we hope to greet you back uh, someday again to talk about this a bit more, I think. Yeah. It deserves uh, more time as well. So okay. thank you for being here. Thanks for the invitation. Okay.